hear me first, that would be great. Perfect. Um, okay, so welcome everyone. Thanks for attending today's webinar. I'm looking forward to talking to you about business planning today. Um, my name is Danielle Grimes and I'm a business advisor with WESC out of the Saskatoon office. Um, I work with clients one-on-one -on, -one on their business plans um, as well as their existing businesses or kind of sorting through new ideas and all sorts of different things. Um, if I can have you please type in the chat box the industry that you're in and whether you currently own a business or if you're looking to start one. It just helps me to get a sense of where everyone is at. Okay, so this is an overview of what we're gonna be covering today. We will be making the presentation available after the webinar. It'll automatically be sent out. Um, there are templates available as well. You might have already received them, but if not, you can use the um, web address in this slide to get there. It's our loan workspace where you can find our business plan template and our cash flow template. So feel free to pull that up as we're working through um, the webinar today, or you can access them at any time. So we're going to be starting with a brief overview of WESC, and we'll discuss the purpose of the business plan. Then we'll get into the business plan content, which is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. And we'll wrap up with risk analysis and financing information. If there's time, we'll have some Q&A at the end and in the meantime feel free to throw your questions out in the chat box there's a way to filter your questions so just before you type your message click on that question mark um, and then that way it'll be flagged as a question i'll just take a look here at some of the industries that you're in supply chain consulting natural cosmetics still planning reflexology communications Safety technology, well, so we have quite um, a broad um, mix of industries, which is awesome. And it looks like some of you are looking to start a business and some of you already have a business. And either way, it's really a good exercise to have a business plan. Okay, so WESC was officially created in 1995 with six members, and we now have, I think, a thousand members or somewhere in there. Um, so the founding of WESC came after much development and preparation work. There were focus groups conducted across the province representing women from rural, rural and urban Saskatchewan to identify common barriers faced by Saskatchewan businesswomen and the services that they need they needed. So we are a nonprofit federally funded by Western Economic Diversification Canada. Um, and we have offices in Saskatoon and Regina, but we serve all of Saskatchewan. So we offer a few services to address the needs that as an entrepreneur you might have, including business advising for starting, building or growing your business or just operating a successful business. So we work with you one on one and we can also help you in creating your business plan and you have access to unlimited business advising. Um, we also offer financing. So we provide loans from $5,000 to $150,000. And we have different learning and connecting opportunities. So when we're able to, we offer in person workshops, lunch and learns. Right now, everything is being conducted over webinar, and we've got tons of webinars up on our website that you can already watch, and new ones coming out all the time. And networking is another important part of WESC as well when we're able to do that. Currently, we're offering Shaken with a Twist and Uncorked um, over Facebook. Um, Okay, so we'll get into entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? So it's the capacity and willingness to develop, organize, and manage a business venture along with any of its risks in order to make a profit. And the entrepreneurial spirit is characterized by innovation and risk taking. So there's a TED Talk about grit by Angela Lee Duckworth that I'd encourage you to check out. And it's that link here on the slide. And again, this will be sent out afterwards as well. So she talks about how grit is the perseverance and passion for long-term goals. And research shows that success doesn't depend on talent. It depends on intensely focusing on a goal with passion and perseverance. 
So again, success doesn't depend on talent. It depends on intensely focusing on a goal with passion and perseverance. So in entrepreneurship, you're you're going into the unknown where there's no guarantees and you're relying on your intrinsic motivation. So you can see how grit can be so important in this context. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. So we're going to touch briefly on the business model before we get into the business plan. So the business model is the design and the business plan is the document that describes that design. And there are all sorts of business models. For example, you could be a manufacturer which makes finished goods from raw materials and sells to a distributor. You could be a distributor um, which buys from the manufacturer and sells to the retailer or public. Um, you could be a subscription model like Netflix. You could be a model that relies on advertisements like YouTube. You could have be a service model like consulting. Um, you could be a freemium business model that offers basic services for free, but then charges a fee for an upgrade like Spotify or SurveyMonkey. So if you're still in the idea phase, um, I'd encourage you to first consider your business model before you dive into the business plan. Um, okay, so the as I said, the business plan is the blueprint of your business and it outlines the direction that you'll take, how you'll get there and the projected results. So it reflects how all the pieces of your business can fit together. So it helps you to evaluate whether it'll be successful or if you need to tweak your business plan. And it's also dynamic. So it's going to change over time as you adjust your services or your product offerings to meet consumer demand and adapt your marketing and strategy. So your long-term goals may also change dramatically as new opportunities and issues arise. So it's not just meant to be a document that you do before you open your business and never look at again. It is meant to be something that you go back and reflect on to see how you're progressing and to make any changes necessary. So when you start your business, it can be easy to lose sight of your goals when you're busy dealing with the day-to-day -day responsibilities and you'll be inundated with advice and people telling you about different opportunities to expand your services and products, et cetera. But with a business plan, you have more confidence to say, that's a great idea, but that doesn't fit into my plans right now, maybe in the future, or that idea really does fit into my business concept or strategy right now. So a business plan has both internal and external benefits. It forces the founding team to work together to hammer out the details, and it can also communicate the merits of a new business venture to outsiders. Um, lenders won't consider financing a business that doesn't have a business plan in most cases. So here are some signs of a good business plan. Market segmentation. So not everyone is your customer. And if you try and be everything to everyone, you can end up being nothing to nobody. And we'll talk a lot about market segmentation soon. Having a clear plan for how you will achieve your goals. So you can actually develop an action plan from your business plan. Having realistic financial projections that are based on thorough research that you've conducted. Uh, a risk mitigation plan. So it's much better to identify risks and how you would uh, deal with those as opposed to not um, addressing them at all. Having a clear, concise presentation. So you're going to be looking at your business plan a lot. And so it's always helpful to have someone else take a look at it to, um, you know, notice any errors that you might have been overlooking and have some confidence. So you've done a lot of work and you know your stuff. So stand behind that and be confident in it. And having an equity contribution if you're looking for financing. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So these are the key sections of a business plan. Most templates will include some variation of this, including the WESC template. The key sections include marketing, operations, human resources, and the financial plan. Human resources can be included within the operations plan. It depends on your business and how important human resources will be to your business. If you don't have any employees, then you don't have to have a separate human resources section. And then go back and do the executive summary at the end. This summarizes your whole plan. 
And your appendices can include things like a resume, lease agreements, quotes, that sort of thing. So we're going to start with the marketing section. Um, your marketing research and strategy is a good place to start when evaluating your business or your business idea because it identifies whether there's a market for it and if so, how you would reach them. So the marketing strategy identifies your customers, competitors, and your market, and it also outlines the methods you'll use to reach your customers. So the market analysis includes research, which is the left-hand side of the chart, and the marketing planning, which is the right-hand side, describes how you'll apply that information to your business. So we'll start with talking about the market analysis, also known as the research, which is the left-hand side of this chart. So the market analysis can be categorized into these three broad categories. As we work through them, we'll get more specific. So we'll start with the industry you're operating in, then we'll start looking at your competitors and then your customers, and we'll talk about each category. So starting with the industry, an industry is a collection of businesses categorized by specific business activity. And it's important to understand your industry because it's the environment that you're operating in. So the reason we look at your industry is because each one will have certain characteristics specific to that industry. Industry trends are changes in the market and they're important because they're the sources of new opportunities and threats. For example, Blockbuster was negatively affected by the online streaming trend. They could have instead identified this as an opportunity, but they didn't do so soon enough or effectively. So you can find opportunities in an industry by looking at trends and patterns of change. Other questions to ask include, how volatile is the industry? Meaning, does the industry experience a lot of ups and downs? What are the barriers to entry? Meaning, is it difficult for easy or easy for new competitors to enter the industry? So for example, there are a lot of barriers to starting a casino because it's a highly regulated industry with high capital costs compared to say a clothing retail store. So if your industry has high barriers to entry, you're going to be challenged in addressing those barriers. However, it can be a good thing because it's harder for new competitors to enter that industry also. If it's a low barriers to enter industry, that means that you could easily enter the industry, but so can a lot of new competitors. Regional trends are also important and being aware of what's happening in Saskatchewan and your target area, whether it's Saskatoon, Regina, a different region. Um, the industry growth rate is also important. So in other words, is the market growing and what's its annual growth rate or has the market slowed? So you can compare e-commerce to brick and mortar bookstores, for example, and you can see how that's an important factor. Financial institutions and funding agencies will also use that information in making investment decisions. We also want to look at critical success factors, and those are the things that you have to get right in order for your business to be successful and grow. So, for example, in the coffee and snack shop industry, access to a good workforce, cost controls, and market positioning are important. So, as you can see, understanding your industry can give you valuable insight into opportunities and what you might need to do in order to be successful. So you might be wondering where you can actually find this information. Um, luckily, you can actually request free reports from Square One. They have offices in Regina and Saskatoon, and you can get in touch with them. Um, the IBIS World Report is one of those reports that they can provide, and it gives you an overview of the industry in Canada, and it touches on the items that we spoke about in the previous slide. So here's a screenshot of the coffee and snack shop industries IBIS IBIS World Report. So you can request that for your industry. There are two types of research. The first is secondary research and it includes the examples I gave in the previous slide. And it can also include things like the history of the industry. And so how could past trends impact your predictions and what does this mean for your industry? It also includes industry benchmarks like average cost structure for your industry. And you can look at spending habits. So is consumer spending up or down? What are consumers spending on? And how sensitive is your industry to consumer spending habits? So when consumer confidence is down, 
people are less likely to purchase items that are considered a luxury, but they're still going to need to purchase the necessities. So for example, toilet paper or food would be a necessity, but something like, oh, I don't know, um, skidoos or ATVs would be considered a luxury. So where on that spectrum do you fall with your business? It's important to know that so you can know how you'd be affected by economic factors. Primary research, on the other hand, is conducted on your own from direct sources. So you can do focus groups, interviews with possible customers, surveys, observations of the competition. You could scope out a potential spot by looking at traffic patterns at different days and times. So it's an opportunity to be creative. You could also contact similar businesses in other markets to hear their story and what they learned. You could reach out to industry associations that are applicable to you. Um, they often have some great information. And those of you who are already have um, your own business and you're operating your own business, then you're conducting primary research on a daily basis. So you're gonna have a lot of that information already just because you've already been operating your business. Secondary research gives you a broader perspective of the industry and primary research gives you a more focused perspective. And they're both, both important in order to give you a necessary insight into your business. Um, moving on to industry laws and rules. So what are the laws and rules that are applicable to your industry? So what do you need to be aware of as you open your business? So run through these categories and assess your own business. What political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental considerations are you going to need to address? So for example, a restaurant would have different health and safety regulations than a retail store would. So just do your research into how you're affected and how you need to address these different factors. So we've talked about industry. Now, what's a market? So a market is a place where buyers and sellers meet to exchange goods and services for money. So you can start with the total population and then narrow it down from there using market segments. And there are different types of markets. So do you sell to a consumer or do you sell to other businesses? So are you a business to consumer or are you business to business? And it's important to define your market and its geographical scope. So are you focusing on your city or province wide or national or international? Or maybe you're planning on starting local and then expanding. So this is information to include in your plan. Make sure that you define that. And so once you know what your local market is, you can actually determine its potential size. And so your customer is not everyone. It's important to estimate your market size based on who your customer is. And we'll talk more about defining your customer in a little bit. Uh, you can get demographic reports from square one, which includes expenditures in different categories. So here um, you can see how much people in Saskatoon are spending on furniture in a year. So it can be really helpful information. For example, if you're targeting seniors and you know your market area, you can find out how many people are in your market. And so if there aren't enough in your market, then you could go back to the drawing board. And so that's why you're doing a business plan. And then you should also consider how many competitors you have who are also taking some of that market share. So, that, so now that you know how many people are in your market, you can try to estimate your potential revenues as well. So sales forecasting is not black and white, but there are different formats that you can use to help with your sales forecasts and to help sort of show your work essentially in your business plan. And your sales, your, um, your forecasting is gonna help you to understand what your revenue is, which feeds into your financial plan. So it's an educated yeah, estimate based on data gathered in your market research. And there are two methods that you could use. This one is the bottom up method. So we recommend you try both methods and compare the results. The other is the top down method, which we're gonna talk about next. 
and the accuracy of your projections is reflected in the closeness of the two values. And if there's a difference between the values, then you can rework your calculations and assumptions. So with this bottom-up method, you're starting with doing primary research on your possible location and also making some estimates. You're starting with the number of people passing your location, estimating the number who will enter your business, their average purchase, and the number of days you'll be open. And the more information you have to back up these assumptions that you're making, the better. With the top-down method, you're starting with secondary research, so the number of people in your market area. Then you're estimating the percentage who would use a business like yours, the number of times they would use the business per year, and the average sale. Then you would take into consideration the number of existing competitors to see what your sales might be. And so overall, it takes some work to get some forecasting numbers. Um, the more information you gather, the better, and the more explanation you provide for your sales forecasts, the better, especially if you're applying for financing, but even just for your own benefit as well. So we've talked about industry and markets. Now we're gonna talk about competitors. So there are different types of competitors um, and remember, don't discount competitors just because they're a little different from you. That's um, a mistake that we see very often. Um, there is direct competition and there's indirect competition. And so indirect competitors are competitors that, we, that you still shouldn't overlook. Um, so for example, a direct competitor of, of Santa Lucia Pizza would be Pizza Hut and an indirect competitor of Pizza Hut would be Fat Burger. So the two pizza places are direct competitors, but Fat Burger is also an indirect competitor because they're satisfying the same need, but not providing the same product. So if I'm hungry one day, I'm not gonna go eat pizza and then go eat Fat Burger right away after, right? So um, in that way, they are a competitor. So don't, don't overlook um, those types of competitors. Another example would be, Coke and Pepsi being direct competitors and Pepsi and milk being indirect competitors because again, they're satisfying the same need. And so then marketing strategies can be developed based on your knowledge of your competitors. And so you might feel you have a good idea of who your competitors are already and you likely you do but it's always a good idea to also request a list of competitors from square one. And you can get a report that looks something like this, and it's going to estimate um, the sales volume and expenses of your competitors. So you can get some useful information and it can also just be a good check to make sure there's no one that you've overlooked. And so then, Using a chart like this, you can actually compare yourself to your competitors to understand what are your key differentiators um, and what's really setting you apart. So the critical success factors that I touched on earlier are variables that impact the efficiency, effectiveness, and viability of your business. So they're on the left-hand side of the chart and they change based on the business. So you'll need to identify the critical success factors for your industry and your business. And so the examples we have here are product, price, quality, service, and target market, but that might look a little different for you. And then you can compare yourself to your competitors based on those factors. So understanding your competitors' strengths and weaknesses and what makes you stand out compared to your competitors can drive your strategy. And so it should ideally be a, a, um, a really good strength that's distinctive and can appeal to your customers and can help to build a sustainable competitive advantage. So you can always make changes based on what you learned about your competitors. So for example, if you find that your business compared to competitor A is virtually the same on all of the key success factors that you've identified, then the next step would be to figure out how you could set yourself apart. What could you tweak about your business? to be able to better compete. Some of you might be familiar with 
a SWOT analysis. You might have done it with organizations that you've worked for before. It's an effective tool for existing or new businesses. And it puts together a lot of the concepts that we've talked about. And so you're starting with your business's internal strengths and internal weaknesses, and then you're looking at external opportunities and external threats. And then you can look at how you might be able to turn your weaknesses into strengths or your threats into opportunities. So here's an example. So say that I own a restaurant in a small town and I offer diner style food. So I've done a SWOT analysis on my business and my strengths include that I've got good friendly service and a loyal customer base. My weaknesses are that I hear from customers that the food is greasy and not very healthy. Opportunities that I've identified are that um, truckers stop on the highway, but they don't know about me, so they don't come to my restaurant. And threats include that there's an ice cream shop opening this summer down the street. So then this is my current state and what could I do to change it? So the next step is to address those weaknesses. Um, so maybe I could offer a daily healthy special of soup and salad. It doesn't have to change the whole menu, but I could provide an option for those looking for a healthy choice. To address the opportunity, maybe I could start an advertising campaign or put up a billboard or offer discounts for truckers to attract them. To address the threats of the ice cream shop, maybe I could offer um, like a slushies or something like that. Maybe I could buy a slushy machine to attract that clientele. So these are just ideas and you, you won't necessarily go and implement all of the ideas that you have, but the SWOT analysis has given me an opportunity to understand my environment and some opportunities so that I'm not missing out on those opportunities. So we've talked about the industry and competitors and now we're getting into the customers. So your customer is not everyone. It's someone who's going to buy your goods and services from your business. And so how do you actually identify who your customer is? You can use a, a tool called segmenting, targeting, and positioning. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So segmenting is the process of dividing your market up into smaller markets. You can use geographic, demographic, like age or gender, psychographic, like lifestyle, um, behavioral factors like brand loyalty to divide up your market. And then you can even combine those four categories to create a customer profile. So here's an example of how I might segment um, my cafe. So I have a cafe called Danielle's Cafe. It's very creative. Um, and it's, lo it's located at the, U the lower, lower Place Real at the U of S. And so here's a couple of profiles that I was able to develop. The first one is students. So they are younger, 18 to 35 years old approximately, and they're on a budget because they've got a lower income, of course. They're located at the U of S. Um, they are brand aware and they're seeking convenience because they're probably in a hurry and they're also price conscious because they're on a budget. Behaviorally, they're coming to me for during study periods or for meals and snacks between classes. They're moderate to heavy users, especially around exam time, and they have an irregular schedule because they've got classes at different times every day. Another profile would be um, faculty members who are a little bit older, 35 to 65, and they've got a higher income. They're also located at the U of S. Um, they're willing to pay more for quality, and they prefer quality and taste over brand prestige. They don't much care about brand. And behaviorally, they're on more of a routine. So they're morning coffee drinkers, they have regular schedules, and they're moderate users. It's not going to fluctuate as much. So I've also identified two other market segments. Um, including office workers and visitors, and I was able to estimate the size of each segment. So as you can see, the student segment is the largest, followed by office workers, and visitor. the visitor segment is quite small. So 
So now that you've identified your market segments, how do you actually assess them? Here are some criteria that you can use to assess the quality of your segments. So are they clear? Can you provide a description of each segment? Are they measurable? So are you able to measure the effective size of each segment? Are they accessible? So can we gain access to that segment through promotional efforts? Are they substantial? Is the segment large and profitable? And is it actionable? So can effective marketing programs be designed and attract that segment? So now that we know our market segments, it's time to figure out who we should target. So that's the next step. We've done segmenting, now we're on to targeting. And remember, you can't be everything to everybody. So what segment is most attractive? Um, you can look at what your, who your competitors are targeting as well. Who best aligns with your brand? Who's easiest to reach? What market is largest? So those are some of the questions that you can ask yourself. So with my cafe, which segments might be the most attractive? And so um, you might immediately say students are the most attractive because they're the largest segments or they're the largest segment. And that may be, but also consider the fact that students aren't there all year round. There are um, not as many of them over the summertime and they have more turnover than staff would as well because they're there for a few years and then they're on their way, whereas office workers or faculty might spend, um, you know, a decade at the university. And staff members also keep a more regular schedule, so they're more predictable as well. They're in more of a routine. Um, but for the purposes of this example, we will say that we're targeting students. But in your case, for your business, really think through who's, who makes most sense to target. So positioning is the last step in the process. You've segmented your market and you figured out who you're going to target. Now, how do you appeal yourself to your target market? In other words, how do you position yourself? So you probably have some connotations that come to mind when you see each of these logos. Uh, with McDonald's, you might think quick and cheap. With Louis Vuitton, you might think expensive and high quality. So what do you want people to think when they see your brand? For example, if you're, start, if you're targeting students in my cafe, how might you want to position yourself? Maybe that you're cheap, you're quick, and um, in terms of brand prestige, maybe use social media influencers, for example. So we've gone through the process of figuring out who we're going to target and how we're best going to position ourselves in our marketing strategy. Now that's that covers the research side of marketing. So now we're getting into the how or the planning part of your marketing. So this is the right hand side of that chart that we looked at at the beginning. So this is the marketing mix, which is a set of tools and actions for businesses and marketing objectives. So the marketing mix refers to broad levels of marketing decision categories, namely product price, place, promotion, performance and people. And so it's a way of categorizing how you're going to approach your marketing, essentially. So starting with your product or service, um, describe your product. What need does it satisfy? Going back to positioning, how is it branded? What do people think when they see your brand? Going back to your competitor analysis, how is it different from your competitors? So pull that information together to describe your product. And here's a format that you can use to describe your product. You can describe the features. So it's essentially describing your product. The advantages. So what competitive advantage does it have over your competitors? And the benefits. So how does it meet your customers' needs? That's, a, that's of course, really important. Now we move on to pricing. So pricing is a challenge for many entrepreneurs. And these are some of the questions that you'll need to answer when you're determining your pricing strategy. So what is the value of the product? How much will you charge? Will you offer discounts or loyalty rewards? How does your price compare to your competitors? 
So make sure you're answering these questions. It's not just a matter of simply stating your price. We need some more information than that. And so when it comes to the question of how much to charge, um, here are some considerations to factor in. So costs, make sure you know your expenses. How much do you need to charge in order to at least break even? And we'll be talking about financial projections shortly where you'll be able to calculate this. But at the very least, you're, you need to charge an amount that's going to allow you to break even. And then you can look at that amount and see if it's realistic or not. If it's already too high, then you know you go back to the drawing board. Um, competition. So what is your competition charging and how do you compare it to them on quality, service, etc.? So you can go back to your competitor analysis chart if you need to. Um, it's usually not advisable to just sell for slightly cheaper than the competitors as you can get into pricing wars and it's not typically a sustainable um, competitive advantage. Psychology is another factor. So what's the perception at different prices? Often people perceive high quality, high price with quality. So is quality part of your key differentiating factor? And if so, take that into account when you're developing your pricing strategy. So if you look at this graph here, where do you think that your business will fit in? So can you think of examples of companies fitting into each quadrant? You know, high quality, high price, for example, could be like Louis Vuitton. High quality, low price could be, say, the Kirkland brand. Low quality, low price could be Walmart. And low quality, high price, we won't go there because it's likely a quadrant that you don't want to fall into. So the answer is not going to be perfect in terms of how you should price yourself. And there's probably going to be some trial and error. But make sure that you've taken these considerations into account. The more factors that you consider, the um, better you're going to be able to price your, your product or your service. So moving on to place, where will you sell? So will you sell online, on, via brick or mortar, or both, and why? If you have a brick and mortar location, what makes the selection suitable for your business? So is it close to your market or your suppliers? or your transportation, the distribution system or channel distribution, um, is the route taken by your product in order to reach the end user of your product. So you should discuss the different avenues that you'll be selling your products in your business plan. So for example, will you use retail stores, trade shows, wholesalers, uh, personal selling, or some combination of that? If you're providing a service directly to your customers, how important is accessibility to your customer base and how much are they willing to pay for it? So if you have a restaurant, for example, what are your hours of operation and is your location convenient? Is parking readily available and things like that? And will you own or lease your space or will you operate out of your home? And do you have any construction or leasehold improvements that you need to do? So discuss that in your business plan as well. You would include quotes for leasehold improvements or construction in your business plan, and that would be part of any project startup or expansion costs that you might have. And remember, don't sign anything until your lawyer has reviewed it. Um, if you're looking at signing a lease, landlords look at leases all the time, but you probably don't. So make sure that you've had a lawyer review it. And you can have it subject to financing and inspection and things like that too. So moving on to people, this goes back to your target market. So make sure you consider who's making the, the purchasing decision. If you're targeting kids, then you'll also be marketing to parents. So this is your um, target market. So moving on to promotion. This is a really important part of your marketing strategy. So how will customers find you? How will you get your message out? What channels will you use? So use methods that make sense based on your customer profile. So for example, if you're targeting elderly people, then TV and mail might be effective promotional strategies. 
for younger populations, social media might be the most effective. So the more you know how to reach your customer, the better bang for your buck. So just ha even having an understanding of where your customers network and spend their time, especially for you consultants out there, um, that's really effective in kind of the personal selling aspect, which is important when you're providing a direct service like consulting or say if you're a lawyer or something like that. Um, so for example, a marketing agency spoke at our conference last year and they worked with a client who really wanted the business of one specific company. So the client poured their marketing budget into wrapping the elevator that the decision makers of that company used and they got the business after a month. So that's an extreme example of knowing your target and focusing your efforts because they put all of their budget into wrapping one elevator that the decision makers were using but it really does illustrate how important it is to know who you want to target and how you can best reach them. Page 11 of the business plan template includes a list of examples of promotional channels as well. There's, there's many of them, of course, like TV ads, print ads, outdoor ads, website, Instagram, search engine optimization, networking, trade shows, just to name a few. And you can actually use that to develop an actionable plan. So what promotional strategies will you use and when? The next is performance. So you can actually measure the outcomes of your marketing efforts. So first you need to set your goals of your marketing efforts. So there are a few types of performance goals, including uh, you could be uh, aiming to create awareness, you could be aiming to attract new customers, you could be developing a corporate image, or you could be establishing repeat customers. So I'll repeat that. You could be creating awareness, attracting new customers, developing a corporate image, or establishing repeat customers. Then you can track and measure your results. So first define the channels that you want to track for example, Google search, email, referral, social media. You can measure via things like Google Analytics, like what keywords people use to land on your site, social media likes and analytics. You could use promotional codes so that you know where you, your customers heard from you. And this might not be um, straightforward or you might need more help with that. And um, a business advisor or our all access program where you can meet with a marketing expert can help with that as well if you need more support. Great, so that wraps up our marketing plan. Now we're gonna move on to the operations. So your operations plan includes a lot of topics. A couple of items that I'll highlight includes your capacity. So do you actually know what your capacity is? So how many items could you produce in a day or how many classes could you teach or how many clients can you serve? That's important for you to know, um, you know, what your limit is in terms of your sales projections as well as your growth strategy. So do you want to be able to grow more? And if so, what does that mean for your business? Um, it might impact your location that you choose or the equipment that you purchase, even your staffing needs. So you might purchase equipment that is beyond the capacity that you currently need, but keeping in mind your growth plans, you know you're gonna need it. Or with your staffing needs, maybe you hire people who have management capacity in the future because you know you're gonna need to hire more employees down the road. Your cost of goods sold are costs that are directly attributable to the production of your goods or services. And so that's something that goes into your financial projections and it can help you to see the profitability of your different product or services. Another item to consider is your business structure. So these are the most common types of business structure. Sole proprietorship, partnership and corporation. And these are some of the key differences, but we always advise that you consult with both a lawyer and an accountant before making a decision. So a sole proprietor has one owner and it's and is personally liable for all debts of the business. And you pay personal income tax rates and typically lower startup costs. A partnership is similar to a sole proprietorship, but with more than one owner. 
If you are in a partnership, make sure you do up a partnership agreement with a lawyer to outline how you would navigate different circumstances. And it's important to do that at the beginning while everything is um, going well. And a corporation is a legal entity that pays corporate tax rates and there can be additional costs. So again, talk to a lawyer and an accountant before making these decisions because there are legal and tax considerations. So the human resources plan. When you're creating this part of your business plan, there are a few things to consider, including recruitment, training, and retention. So how will you find your employees? What sort of onboarding process do you have? And how will you keep them around? Do you have any um, wage skills developed and things like that? So developing job descriptions, who's, who's responsible for what, um, employee schedules, so how many staff you need on, on at a given time and working out that schedule. A reporting structure, so do you have kind of a hierarchy in place? And make sure you consult the Labor Standard, Standards Act, excuse me, and OHS regulations and understand source deductions like CPP, EI, and WCB. And so the ownership and management plan, uh, as an owner, you're key to the business. So if you're applying for funding, they're going to want to know who you are and what your background is. So include your resume and any other owners or management personnel. You're the person driving the business, and so you're really a key factor and consideration in the business plan and in when um, making financing decisions as well. And professionals are also very important. So indicate who your accountants and lawyers are. And it's okay to shop around when you're looking for professionals. Ask lots of questions. Ask your network if they've got recommendations. Um, ask those professionals if there's certain industries that they focus on. Bookkeepers can also be very helpful if you don't have that sort of background. So they can help to make sure that you're spending time on what you're good at and making sure that your books are in order so that you can make the best decisions possible. So your books get, can get away from you pretty quickly if it's not your forte, and in most cases it isn't, and it's not where your time is best spent. Um, bookkeeping is not a regulated industry, so uh, make sure you do some due diligence when finding a bookkeeper. You can also talk to a business advisor about bookkeepers that we have that we would recommend. Um, bookkeepers have different roles than accountants do. They're each important and bookkeepers typically charge quite a bit less than accountants do. And mentoring and networking is important too. So as a business owner, you might find that you're a little bit isolated and you don't have people you can relate to anymore. And so networking and finding that um, group of people who can understand what it's like to be a business owner can be really helpful. And so that's why WESC offers networking events, um, you know, when that's possible, of course. So moving on to the financial plan, it answers all of these questions here. So how much are you going to need in order to start your business or to grow your business? So some of you might be already operating in your business, or I know some of you are. Uh, you might be looking to expand, though. So how much are you, are you going to need for that expansion? Um, how much of your own money do you need to contribute? And how much are you going to need to borrow, if any? What will you, what will you do with those funds that you borrow? And how will you pay back your lenders? And ultimately, how profitable is your business going to be? Which is something that everyone's interested in. So you can find this chart in the business plan template and it addresses your startup or expansion costs, your investment and your financing needs. So the left hand side is how much you need to start your business and the right hand side is how you're going to pay for that. And so try and be as accurate as possible when you're making this list of um, funds based on the information and understanding that you have. So get quotes, be a very, um, specific because you don't want any surprises. 
you don't want to end up with more money than you need or less money than you need. You could even go to the competitor site if you do have a brick and mortar location and, and look at all of the little things that they have in their business that you might not have thought of. Okay, so this is our cash flow projections template. You can find it on our website. You can work with a business advisor if you have a membership um, to help with this as well, because depending on how comfortable you are with financial statements and with Excel, um, you know, you might need some assistance. Something to keep in mind is you only enter numbers into the yellow cells. And so here we're on monthly cash flow year one, and these are our startup costs for my cafe. So you can see here I'm purchasing, um, or I'm make, doing $20,000 in leasehold improvements, for example. So that's where you would enter those startup costs that we talked about in the previous slide. In addition to your startup costs, you're also going to have ongoing operating costs like rent and wages, utilities, loan payments. And you might need some financing to cover those costs before you're making revenue as well. Again, it depends on your business. And so this is where you would enter those ongoing monthly costs. We're in the monthly income statement year one tab, and I've entered in my monthly costs. So I'm spending um, let me see here, $500 a month on marketing, for example. Also included in that income statement is your cost of goods sold. So I mentioned that in your operations plan, but it includes all costs that are directly attributable to the production of your goods or service. And it includes the cost of materials for that product. So it does not include indirect expenses like lease expense or marketing. So cost of goods is only the expenses that you'll have if you make a sale. So you may have different costs of goods for different products or service lines, and that's good. It'll show you how profitable each service line is. And so this is how you would calculate it. So if the ingredients for my coffee at my cafe are $1, and I'm selling it for $4, then my cost of goods sold is 25%. And that's the number that you would enter in the cost of goods sold section, as you can see in the slide. My food cost of goods is higher at 35%. And so when you enter that percentage, then the spreadsheet calculates your cost of goods for you based on your sales. So then you would scroll up to the um, sales part of the income statement and you would enter your revenue projections that you developed in your business plan. And so here I've taken into account the fact that the first couple of months I won't have significant revenue because I'm just starting up. And so keep, keep that in mind when you're doing your projections. The first couple of months are likely going to be slower because you're just getting started, you're just getting your marketing going, you're working out bugs, things like that. And then I've also taken into account that my business is going to be seasonal. So in May, my sales are decreasing quite significantly because that's when students, a lot of students are gone for the summer. And so that's something to consider when doing your sales projections is how will you be affected by any seasonal factors. <clears throat> So then on your net income statement, you can see at the bottom your either net income or loss each month. So I make a profit in March and April, and then it declines again due to the seasonality. So you can see it's being affected by the fact that the first couple months are slow and that it's a seasonal business. You can also look at the cash flow tab to see how much cash you'll actually have at the end of each month. So to recap, here are the categories that are included in your income statement. So in addition to your cost of goods and your ongoing expenses, you'll enter in your sales projections to see what your net income or loss is each month. And when you're filling this out, try and be as accurate as possible based on the information and the understanding that you have. 
and you're using all the information that you gathered in the rest of your business plan to fill it out and you're not on your own we can help with this as well the spreadsheet will also calculate your break even for you so it's when your total revenues are equaling your total costs and so it's helpful to understand this so you know you can tell when your business will be able to generate a profit and what your financing needs will be to, to sustain it in the meantime so that wraps up the financial section the risk analysis is an important part of your business plan because it outlines your strengths and weaknesses um, it analyzes the potential hazards and addresses how you would deal with those risks or hazards so for example if your sales were less than you expected causing cash flow problems what will you do will you go back to your day job part-time will you back off do you have a line of credit as backup or what would you do if your sales are more than expected causing supply and delivery problems staffing problems and cash flow issues so lenders want to see that you've thought through those various scenarios and address them and it's also helpful for you as well if you're suddenly faced with a challenge you've already got a plan to address that and it's less of a panic your exit strategy is also important because you'll make decisions based on this so for example if you know that you want to be able to sell your business in five or ten years then you probably don't because someone is might if I have my name attached to it it's going to be harder to sell that you might not want the name to be location specific like second avenue cafe if again you want to be able to sell that to someone who might want to change locations and so now that you know your startup costs you'll know whether or not you need financing and so if you do, most financial institutions require that the owner contributes a certain amount of their own funds. So it's like the down payment on a house. They're looking for an equity contribution of 10 to 20% of the total value of the business. So if, you need, if your project costs are $100,000, most lenders are going to be looking at you putting in upwards of $20,000 yourself. But every situation and institution is different. And at WESC, at least, that is a case-by-case -case basis. If you don't have enough equity, then one strategy is to align the scale and growth of the business to um, a more manageable amount. So maybe you find a way to reduce those project startup costs. Here are some sources of financing. Um, there are also grants available for very specific areas uh, or industries on the provincial and federal websites. So we have loans up to $150,000. There's no minimum amount. There's also um, entrepreneurial organizations like PDC, Futurepreneur, CIF, Clarence Campo. There's angel investors like the Saskatchewan Capital Network, family and friends, and of course, banks and credit unions. So if you are applying for a loan, these are some of the things that lenders will look at. They'll look at your credit history. So once you apply for a loan, they'll use Equifax or TransUnion Canada to check your personal credit history, or you can also check your credit history yourself. At WESC, we don't have a specific cutoff. It's again on a case-by-case -case basis. They'll look at the viability of the business plan and the likelihood of success. So how well thought out is your business idea? And what are the chances it'll succeed? They'll look at management. So what's your capacity, your experience? Security, otherwise known as collateral, um, that can be business or personal assets. So if you're taking out a loan, typically your lender is going to look at using something for collateral. And then your equity contribution that we've already talked about. So to apply for financing at WESC, um, you can talk to a business advisor about your situation and go from there. Some basic criteria include that you need to be um, 
18 or older, and the business needs to be woman owned and controlled by 51%. So here are some, here are the top 10 tips for entrepreneurs. Have a business plan and revisit it, of course. Have your professionals on board. Read the fine print and get a lawyer to read the fine print too, depending on the situation. Establish relationships with your professionals. Seek out other entrepreneurs for that support that we talked about or join a mentorship group. Network, again, some of these are harder or easier said than done currently. Um, but it's important. Work on your business and not in it. So that's something that can happen really often is you get so in the business and just the day-to-day -day that you forget to take a step, step back and look at your strategy. Um, delegate and empower your employees because they're going to be one of your best assets and resources. And of course, have fun and enjoy living your dream. Um, so that's everything. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. I'll give you a few minutes to see if we've got some questions. Yes, we will be sending out a copy of the slides after the webinar. And if you don't have any questions, um, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Feel free to log off. I'll just give a few more minutes to see if we have um, any more questions. There will be a recording sent out after the webinar. If you have a really niche product, um, you might be, you might need to do some more primary research and um, do some some direct uh, research by talking to potential customers. Um, another tip can be you can talk to a similar business in a different market area. So if you're not competing for the same market, you could find out how they, they were able to be successful and, and how they overcame that challenge. Um, you could talk to a business ad advisor more specifically about your situation as well. And if you haven't requested those reports from Square One, still do, even though it might be a little bit general for you, you might still be able to get some good information that way with your niche product. Um, yes, you can contact us for sure if you've got information, or sorry, if you've got questions. Grant information, um, that is if you, I don't have the link off the top of my head, but if you Google um, Federal Government Canada Small Business Grants, you'll find a web page and they've got a web page for grants. Um, does most of this apply to taking over an existing business? Um, no, lots of this applies to either expanding an existing business that you currently own or starting a new business. If you're taking over an existing business, then um, a business plan would still be effective, but there are some other nuances to purchasing a business as well in terms of financing and um, some specifics that would require some kind of one-on-one -on -one discussions as well.